<laughs> Welcome to Great Mondays Radio. Thanks for coming back and listening to another episode. I'm really excited to have on today urban futurist Lev Kushner. Um, Lev is an interesting character uh, in all the ways. Um, he writes a lot about his observations about urban development and cities. And I asked him to come on to talk a little bit about some of the trends that he's been seeing when, when it comes to um, back to work, some of the um, possible weaknesses or problems with it. So welcome to Great Mondays Radio Lab. Thanks for coming on. I'm super excited to be here, Josh. Awesome. So let's just start a little bit with your background. It may seem strange to have an um, an urban futurist on a culture, a company culture, a podcast. Can you tell us just a little bit about who you are and how you um, kind of or got to this got to this moment as a observer of urban futures? I guess. <laughs> yeah. Sure. I. I mean. I think the overlap here that's interesting. Well, I'll start with my background. Right. As I'm a city planner by training, worked for uh, city governments, the Bloomberg administration in New York, the Newsom administration here in San Francisco. Uh, then I went out on my own and started Department of Here, um, which works uh, with a range of companies, but kind of started out of this thinking of placemaking, which is a term that they use in urbanism about uh, building places that drive the creation of community that are specific to a a specific geographic place. Um, and I, I spent a lot of my time thinking about communities. And I think that's actually where there's some overlap substantially with uh, your world, corporate culture, right? Is one of the things that a good urbanist is trying to do is to use all the tools at their disposal to create community, to create the infrastructure on which people will meet each other and find things in common and form the kind of bonds. Because uh, you know, a city of people all locked in their own homes and who never go outside is not really a city. I mean, historically, one of the main draws to cities is that you get to come and expose yourself to all these different cultures and perspectives and ways of thinking and that everybody benefits from that transaction that goes yeah. on. And there's a lot of overlap between that and work, right? Is a lot of the, a lot of economists talk about, and they're starting to rethink this right now, but one of the reasons to go into work is to share ideas, to stay at the wall, stand at the water cooler and swap the project you're working on with somebody else. And, oh, well, we should collaborate on this. And that leads to a separate thing, right? right? There's lots right. of studies about R&D facilities where people come up with crazy ideas because they ran into someone in the hallway. Exactly. Right? So let me, so, so I'll just uh, state up front that recently I responded to um, an article that was arguing for bringing people back to the office with a post that said, return to office, get the fuck out, right? RTO, GTFO, like it's not going to happen. Um, stop trying to find the data points that say it's the right thing to do. I just don't see it possible. And and some of the, what my my hypothesis is that those issues, the, the sort of what they're called, the creative collisions of the different people. Well, yes, that doesn't happen yet, but I think we're going to see technological development. Um, and there, we can talk about some of the things that I've seen that kind of point in that direction that maybe could facilitate that. And there's just more productivity that happens at home. It, you spend less um, of your hours commuting and less of your energy in that way. And so you can be more productive and it's possible. Kind of my thesis is it's not for everyone, agreed, but it's possible that I just don't think people are going to go back to the office in a regular kind of weekly fashion. Let's say, just put that as the bar. For sure. Uh, and, you know, one of the, I think one of the moments in time that we're at, right, is the internet has enabled a huge uptick, certainly in America, uh, of the possibility to make things more convenient. That is kind of the direction society has been going with the internet's assistance, right? As you can get everything delivered to your house, you can research from home. You don't, you don't have to leave the house to do many of the things that our parents' generation had to leave the house to do. And that is enormously beneficial, I think, from an economic, from an accountable perspective. Um, but one of the things that I like to say is convenience is the opposite of community. 
right? And another way to say that is other people, God bless them, are really inconvenient because they don't want the things you want exactly when you want them. They want <laughs> other things. But it's that them wanting other things which creates those moments of discovery. I forget the term you just used, right? The, mm-hmm. the creative collisions. The, the creative collisions. Thank you. So I, I think that the work from home movement, which, you know, I'm at home, that I largely am, am benefiting from it. But I think what it is, is it's a yet another expression of that, of us seeking ultimate convenience, right? And it's very nice to be able to work from home. I don't have to commute. I don't have to do all those difficult things that involve going to the office. It's very convenient. I I personally would love to have an existence with an office where I go in three days a week. That would, chef's kiss, that would be perfect for me. Um, I've spent a lot of time with family and that would be fine. Um, but I, <laughs> right. but I, think, um, I, I think what we're seeing right now is just this moment where where it's it's so convenient and how do we balance off that interaction with that convenience that's not to say that you can't interact with other people in substantive and creative ways online i think those tools are they exist and they're growing but when i was reading your piece i remember i sent you an article which seems far afield but i thought it was really relevant which is i'm a big soccer fan excuse me um and uh Chelsea, one of the main teams in London, has hired a new coach, and there was an article about what is he like. And he's known for parachuting in with you know an existing roster, and he just is very deliberate and forceful about pushing everybody together, right? About kind of squeezing them into a space and putting them into the roles they may not be comfortable with pushing everybody outside of their comfort zone in order to achieve this kind of team cohesion over the course of a very long and emotionally exhausting season. And one of the things that I was thinking was, you know, he insists that everybody shakes hands at the beginning of the day or something. I can't remember exactly what the detail was, but it it was this anecdote of like, he insists that people become face to face in person and shake hands. Now, obviously, being a professional athlete is different than being a coder or, uh, you know, whatever your employees are doing out in the world. Um, and and it, by definition requires you be in the same space, at least for soccer. But uh, I think that there's this interesting dynamic, which is if you're, if you're part of a project that requires a sacrifice and not just your time, but it requires like, long hours or just really giving more and pushing you farther outside of your comfort zone. Those types of projects, I think, are going to require more face-to-face interaction than other type of work activities that are just a little bit more modular and transactional. And that I think thinking about that spectrum of are your employees off at home doing just this thing over and over Mm -hmm. again, and not to demean them, right? But is it more widgets or is it more knocking heads together? And I think finding a way for them to shake hands, whether it's in person or you transport that ritual into a digital format, I think that's going to be enormously important. And using that framing going forward is really important. This ch- The way you described this Chelsea coach uh, made me think of um, Jamie Dimon of Chase. Okay. When he, he said, everybody, okay, everybody has to come back. Now it's finance and it's, he's an old, old thinker, yeah. old school, right? But yeah, it's like, he's deliberate and he's very, you know, it's, um, I can't imagine that these soccer players want to, he, I'm sure they're go, rolling their eyes. They're like, I have to shake their hand every, we have to go through this every morning. So yeah. I, maybe the question is like, how much rebuff are you, you know, do you have to get through, right? There's a lot of dialogue around oh well gen z are i don't know lazy or you know they don't want to like they don't want to work as hard or whatever it is which may or may not be true but there's this pushback that we're seeing and from apple employees there was a whole letter that got signed by a a gazillion apple employees and saying no way we are not coming back um yeah coming back as much maybe so it's like you can expect that pushback I mean, do you, is that part of the process? You're like acknowledging it? I don't, I'm just, 
putting some pulling some points yeah, yeah, yeah. Or strings together i think like look my first thing is i try not to do the different generations thing i just i can't get a uh, gen z like i every generation has their own vibe or whatever it is and i find it hard to believe that you can just generalize over a whole generation but i will say that american society as a whole because we're so uh target because we're targeting convenience so consistently we're forgetting about other benefits like you you receive convenience and you lose community right and you lose other things and one of the things that i think about from you know an urban future perspective is if you want I, one of the the lines that I that I started thinking about when I launched Department of Here was you know places are people too, which is a joke. But like at the same time, if you're a city and you're trying to uh, if you're trying to get community to grow, or you're a tourism agency and you're trying to form relationships with your visitors, it can't be one dimensional. If you have a friend and you're always giving and that friend is never giving anything back, it's not really a friendship. You're being used, right? It's purely transactional. And most people come to realize that over time. And I think the same theory applies to places and I think also to work, although I'm not an expert in work like you are, right? What I would say is the Faroe Islands, there's an island uh, chain in the North Atlantic between Iceland and Norway, right? And it's the super off the beaten path spot, but they have the most fascinating tourism strategy, which is not just let's draw everybody in and anybody who wants to come, well, they'll come and they'll spend money and that'll be good, which is undoubtedly good for your economy. Um, what they do is twice a year, I think it's twice, maybe once a year, they close the island to tourists for a whole weekend and you have to apply to come that weekend. And if you come, they expect you to repair trails, to do other physical labor, to improve the island. Um, and the wait list is thousands of people long to get into the island on those weekends. And I think what that gets at is kind of that interesting dynamic between that, that's similar to friendship, right? Like if you, if, if you have a friend who's sick and you go and visit them at the hospital and help them, and then you're sick and they help you, that like makes that, that really locks that relationship in, in a way that it isn't if it's just a transactional relationship. And I think that works to build much more meaningfulness and community around that island. And I think the same certainly works for cities and some of the clients I work with, I encourage them to demand something of their residents. Um, and I think the same thing goes for work, right? When you're working on a project, I don't, you know, I, I can't necessarily speak to, you know, Jamie Dimon and Apple, the people writing to Apple saying they don't want to come into the office anymore. I think one of the things that's getting lost is they're predicating their decision making exclusively on convenience and not on the sense of profound satisfaction that they would get from making a small sacrifice in order to be part of a larger group achieving a larger end. There, right? are, there are some um, uh, articles coming out that um, one is it's not that people don't like being in the office. It's just they don't like the commute. So that's an interesting thing. That's totally fair. There's also the people are coming back to the office, not because you're going to give them free lunches, but because they actually miss the people. Yeah. And I think that's I think that speaks to your your. Yeah, office. Maybe your office is in the wrong place or you hired the wrong people. Yeah. They don't want to hang out with their colleagues. I mean, you know, all those people who live in San Francisco and commute down to Cupertino. That's a long bus ride. Yeah. I, and then, so one, so at the beginning, you started by saying the people who are working on the hardest problems are the ones that should be coming together. I don't know if I meant hardest, if that's what I said. I, I think don't think what that's I, what you said. What did you, what, so restate I, that. I, thing, I, because I, I, think not, it's, I, I think it's, I'm just interested in the idea that there's a range of different type of tasks. And I think this is out there already, like certain people who are coding, they don't really need to be there. And not that coding is not difficult, right? It's, it can be super complicated, right? but they're, they're, it's more modularized, right? And there's other types of tasks that require some sort of abstract creativity stuff, which uh, at least in my experience, is, is easier to accomplish if you're in proximity, physical proximity with people. But there's just also this sense of like 
are people up for making a little bit of a sacrifice in order to feel fantastic at the end? It is an investment, right? And I, I wonder if the framing is wrong. People, you know, there's a lot of old school folks like Jamie Dimon are saying, come back or you lose your job, right? And then there's a lot of people saying like, come back, I'll boot up the ping pong tables again, or, you know, the amenity, I'll just keep jacking up the amenities. But I think like the whole amenity thing, it's, it's the wrong kind of pleasing. Right? There's a totally different kind of pleasing that comes from being that comes from making a sacrifice to be part of something larger. Right. Going back to Pochettino, the coach at Chelsea, right? Is like that's that's what he's trying to get to. Is like you all have to sacrifice a little bit. Yeah, you all have to be a little bit uncomfortable. That's part of the ritual of building a community around a task. Okay, let's take the the analog here. Um the team, the individuals on the team have line of sight to the goal, <laughs> literally yeah. and metaphorically. Yeah, right. We want to win. The coach yeah. is saying we are going, in order for us to work better, to win, you have to come together. This is the things I'm doing. They might roll their eyes, but okay, he's the coach. Yeah. In the business world, what it means to win yeah. And me very different for a lot of yeah. different people. In fact, if you think about quiet quitting or whatever it might be, it's this tension between I'm here to work and you're here to, you know, I, my winning is, you know, I'm just going to make some money and, you know, go home after that and security. And your winning is like, you know, quarterly profits. Right. And so how, uh, I think the I think the question to for for leaders to ask is how do you define the what it is this organization is doing and why? A hundred percent. I also should say like it's fair to point out that these athletes are making millions of dollars a week, so it's a slightly different dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you're right. you're the but but also at the same time there are plenty of professional athletes who are like. F this, I'm making millions of dollars a week. I'm just going to stay here for the rest of the season and then walk. Yeah. Right. They're like, oh, there's some other team somewhere else in Europe or wherever who's going to pay plenty of money to have me play. Yeah. Um, and that happens all the time. All sports fans know that. Yeah. Um, but I think you're getting at something which is interesting, which is maybe part of the problem. And again, I don't think this is a panacea and I don't think this applies to everything. I don't want to come off as quite that naive, but I do think you're getting at something which is that maybe leaders aren't doing a good job of explaining what winning is. Yes, that's exactly like, right. I, I think that's right. And I think, I mean, it's true that, you know, quarterly profits and all those things, but that's not winning. No. Right. That's and I think not. like every once in a while, you see testimonials from people who worked on like, say a product design and launch who are like, God damn, we worked so hard, but that was amazing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's like, that's winning. Yeah. That to me is winning in a business sense, I think. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, so there's sort of the short term um, epics of, you know, launching a new feature and celebrating that. So I think there's a lot of value in celebrating the wins is what we would call them. So literally mm -hmm. the wins, um, pushing new, pushing new features or launching a new product. Um, another component that I talk about a lot is purpose. So that's the big why as to why you're why you're in business beyond making money. I think you need to be very clear with your organization. You need to answer why you're why these people are coming to work before they have to ask before they're going to start asking it. Because once they start asking, why am I here again? Why am I working so hard? To your point, yeah. then you've already lost them. And that's right. So, well, they're in so, selfish mode. Yeah, exactly. They perceive you as selfish, as a leader, as selfish, or whatever it might be. Um, yeah. The other observation that I'm that I or or I, I don't know if if this is this plays into, but there are uh, um one of my clients in particular, and I think this is probably replicated um across the organ uh, across across a lot of the business landscape is that there becomes two sort of two or three classes of people. There's different strata. There's the people that actually have to show up to work. So in this yeah. um uh, front of house. Uh, or bus drivers or package delivery people, right? There's people that cannot do their work from home. And 
what you are articulating is not necessarily these folks that have to do that, but the people that have the opportunity or, or theoretically could do their job, but it's just not, you know, it's a it's the other folks that are currently not well, it's classism. Well, it is classism. That's that's yeah, it's exactly right. And that's the way it's being framed by a lot of folks who feel like, what, what, why are you getting to it's not fair. Sure. And yeah, I, I don't know. But I, mean, I think I just, again, I would point out, and I I would also just say that like they're saying it's not fair, and I, I, I agree that it's not fair. But again, the score sheet that they're using to say it's not fair is the convenience score sheet. Exactly. And it's like, it's more convenient for you. It's less convenient for me. I don't, I, it, it may also be true that the people who have to show up are not feeling part of a team that they get some kind of launch that they feel like a victory at the end of. So that's right. an, an additional problem, right? But there's another universe and you probably have to stretch to imagine it, but like where no one's using the convenience score sheet, but they're using the, do I get to be part of a victory dance score sheet? In that instance, the people who come in win. And the people who stay home are like, how come I don't get to be part of a team? <laughs> That's great. Right? Yeah. And like to think about it like that makes you realize like, oh yeah, we are kind of all locked in the same framework of how to keep score of things. And it's all about who gets to be more, whose life is less inconvenient. You're in San Francisco. I was in the Bay Area for 20 years. It yeah. feels like that men the mentality of Silicon Valley in the Bay Area and the tech the sort of technologically in uh, uh, indebted um, cities feel like everything is being driven towards how can we do things the most efficiently? Yeah, what is the that. most efficient that we can make this? And I feel like a lot of, a lot of apps <laughs> um, are small ideas that are just about making it more efficient, going to pick up your, you yeah. know, it's like someone comes around and picks up your dry cleaner. Uber for this. Right. Uber for this, Uber for that. Right. Uber for that. right. And so it's all about convenience. And so maybe that is part of the mentality, the 21st century mentality that yeah. is sinking us in this yeah. desire of, you're like, well, I am more efficient. I get more time at my keyboards. I don't have to, I can take the time to go, you know, work out. I can be with my family or whatever it might be instead of going into work. But in fact, what, if I were to sort of maybe capture this sentiment, it's work is hard. And I'm not saying staying home work is not, but it's easier in a lot of ways. And maybe that's the way that it should be in order for it to be meaningful. Yeah. So, Really, what we're talking about is meaningfully contributing to a team, a product, a service that you believe in, believe in the cause or believe in the benefit of that. And then it's worth actually doing the, the thing. It's worth commuting a few days a week. Yeah, or, to, be, to be part of a community that's based on a set of values that you're buying into, right? Yeah, you want to you want to be part of that group, right? I mean, I think look, I'm I, I, I'm a little bit cynical sometimes, and I think like, look, at the end of the day, like, I need a job, I need healthcare, I need to pay my bills, right? Yeah, like, exactly. People that's want the bottom of the that's the bottom yeah, of the, value the bottom pyramid. of the pyramid, exactly. Yeah. But I think that like, if you're really doing it right, you've got a thing that's humming along where people want to join because it's a cool place to be. They may not say like, I have a value system that I want to be a part of, right? They just like, that's where the interesting people are. And I want to be hanging out with the interesting people, launching interesting ideas into the world or building new things or whatever their, you know, their role is. But yeah, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. At Atlassian, Atlassian is this uh, company that builds these, you know, enterprise collaboration products. Um, they talk about the, that the, the two reasons that you come together is to either um, connect. So you're going to connect with peers, you're going to connect with the company or your team, um, and to solve complex problems. But I would add to that, based on our conversation today, is that you come together to um, imbue to to get meaning to imbue meaning into it and and actually find additional satisfaction of in in the work that we're doing to together. I would say that when they say to be part of a team, 
they haven't spelled out exactly what that means and that what you're saying and what, what we're agreeing on that's yeah I, I think that's like being part of a team is kind of like a very gestural shorthand for yes. that kind of stuff yes right yeah. but i think thinking a little bit more intently and uh strategically about what being part of a team really means probably has some real benefit to corporate leaders right yeah yeah Make, making people feel like a little bit of sacrifice is going to be worth it yeah putting in right like like contributing to and i i think people are saying well i'm contributing and i'm, I'm already contributing my daylight hours to this but totally. in, in a way it's well, but the yeah go ahead they're contributing hours, right? Like the way you're saying that exactly yeah. is already from the convenience perspective. Yes. It's like, I'm yes. just contributing my, you already have my hours. Like it's already yeah. so inconvenient. It's already yeah. the totally the wrong framing is it's like, man, I worked hard. That was cool, right? It's fun to work hard on something you believe in. That's meaningful. That's meaningful. It's right. It creates meaning, right? You gave something of yourself and you got something back. And on a fundamental level, you experience that investment and return as really deeply gratifying. And being with other people, forming those human bonds, showing up while maybe inconvenient, uh, accelerates, amplifies that meaning. You're able to work on things together in a very productive, compelling way. It's not that you can't do it apart. You sure I'm, there are many teams over the pandemic that created products and launched products and pushed features and all that stuff. But coming together, being with other humans while hard is a way to another type of value. And you you might argue the higher value of actually working beyond health insurance and money. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I think that's it. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, Lev, thank you so much. Lev Kushner, urban futurist. He is the founder, uh, uh, co-founder of Department of Here, an economic development and strategic communications agency. You can learn more about Lev and his work at departmentofhere.com. Thank you for coming on Great Mondays Radio. It was my pleasure. It was great to see you and talk about this stuff. Let's do it awesome. again soon. Thanks, love. Bye.